webinar on International Scope, Resources in the Archive of the Society of Australian Ge uh, Genealogists. Um, it is given by Alexandra Mountain and Gemma Bezik. Um, Alexander Mountain is currently the Archives Manager for the Society of Australian Genealogists. Um, as a public historian and archivist, Alexander emphasizes community collaboration and archival accessibility in all areas of her work. Uh, she is a dedicated or oral historian and works closely with communities to build, maintain, and manage resources relating to their histories. Gemma Beswick is currently the Library Service Manager at the Society of Australia, Ge Australia Genealogists. She is a glam sector professional, having worked in libraries, museums, and galleries in local government and higher education settings for 15 plus years, in which she has undertaken administrative and management roles. Gemma has overseen the management of various community and special collections during her career. Alongside her professional career, Gemma is a passionate genealogist with research interests, including Australian First Nations, Convict Australia, Australia, England, Scotland, as well as early Australian marriage agencies, collectors, and collecting institutes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to get going. Uh, I saw Mary Lynn popped in the chat about the feedback. Is that better for us? We'll see. We'll monitor the chat. Um, hello, hi, I'm Alex, um, and this is my colleague Gemma. Hi. And we are from the Society of Australian Genealogists. Um, before we begin, we'd just like to thank everyone so much from Roots Tech for all of the help that they have given us. It has been so smooth on our end. Everyone has been incredibly helpful, um, and it's just been a really lovely experience. This is our first time presenting at Roots Tech. Um, so we're very excited to be here and we're very excited to talk about the international scope of our collection. So we're looking at resources in the archive of the Society of Australian Genealogists. Um, just a reminder before we get started to please silence all of your electronic devices. Uh, there is no audio or video recording and no photos of these presentations. So please abide by that. Okay, so um, first up, uh, if you're not familiar with this practice, so in Australia, it's very important for us uh, to pay respect to the First Nations people of, um, of Australia. So in that spirit, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters, culture and support of storytelling. And I think as family historians and genealogists, we all know how important that tradition of storytelling is and of passing down of knowledge. So that is something that we really do hold uh, dear to us. So we honour their roles as custodians and practitioners of an unbroken history, culture and beliefs that began more than 65,000 years ago. And we pay our respects to elders past and present of the Gadigal land, and we extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Uh, the Society's offices, archives and library are located within Gadigal land in what we would now call Sydney, Australia, and this is an image of our, um, of our archives building and where our administrative offices are as well. Uh, Alex and I would also like to extend um, that respect to any First Nations people from around the world who are watching our presentation today. So an introduction to the society. So the Society of Australian Genealogists was formed in 1932, uh, so just over 90 years ago, and is the oldest family history society in Australia. Uh, the society is an organisation that welcomes enthusiastic amateurs alongside professional genealogists who share a passion for family history. Our principal objective is the advancement of genealogical education and is reflected in our extensive education program and also in our collections. The society is managed by a small staff, of which Alex and I are two, uh, under the direction of a board of directors, and we could not open our doors uh, and do what we do without the wonder our wonderful team of volunteers as well. So the Society of Australian Genealogists Collection. So among our many activities, uh, as I mentioned, we have a library and archive collections. The library collection contains our print and electronic resources, and our archive collection contains our unpublished manuscripts, photographs, and other materials. So the image on this slide and the one previously, uh, and all of the images you see today in the presentation will be uh, uh, from our archives collection. So if you have any questions about any of them, our contact details will be at the end uh, where you can get in touch with us about a particular one. 
Okay, so we mentioned our really extensive education program. Uh, so we've just put a few uh, points together here of the things we've got coming up, but we would really encourage you to uh, search our website, which is at the bottom of the slide here, and we'll be at the end as well uh, to have a look at what we're offering. So we have groups, uh, research interest groups, which are really focused on a particular geographical area or topic of interest and really allow uh, participants to discuss in depth with a small group um, about these particular topics. There's often presentations uh, from experts at these sessions as well. And so some that we have coming up that you might be interested in, you can see here on the slide, we have our Irish research group, our USA and Canada research interest group, our Chinese Australia research group, and also AI and technology, uh, which is a new group that we've started. Uh, you can also see that the times here that we've got on the slides are uh, Australian Eastern Daylight Time, but we have put in brackets next to them if the sessions are recorded. So if that is the case, you can watch them anytime. Uh, on the right hand side of the slide, we have a selection, a very small selection of our very extensive courses and webinars uh, program. So here um, you can see that at the top there, we've got a longer form course, which is a beginner's practical introduction to family history. Uh, that's a seven part series. We have a webinar, for example, and you can see I've noted that one is not recorded. Uh, but then we have another course as well, uh, writing family history and we have an intermediate research methods. So these are often skills-based and an opportunity for family historians and genealogists to, uh, to build on their skills. So uh, as I said, this is just four of many. So please visit our website to see what you might like to participate in. Okay, so what is our archival collection? So the Society of Genealogists, as I mentioned, has been collecting materials relating to Australia's family history since 1932. And we now have approximately 40, uh, sorry, 65,000 uh, items. So we hold many, many different things in the archives collection and many different types of records. But some of them are family trees, birth, death and marriage documents, family research albums, migration records, records of cemetery and gravesite transcriptions, original diaries, letters, wills and biographies, photographs, magic lantern slides and daguerreotypes, and topographical, parish, naval and ortho photo maps. So many, many different things. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to jump back in. Um, so one of the things that I really wanted to kind of emphasize in the presentation today is why family historians should look at archives like ours, right? That are a little bit different, very unique. Uh, the treasure trove that Gemma was describing, it is incredibly varied. I stumble across something new and fascinating every single day. Um, but it is very different from the usual types of archives that family historians are drawn to that have more statutory documents, uh, different than the government registers where you can get birth, death and marriage certificates or transcriptions. And what I really see as kind of the key um, value of archives like ours is that we offer a social family history. So more than just trees and charts, we have materials in our collection that will help you create a social family history that really can delve into the why and the how of our ancestors' lives. So I'm talking about more unique repositories, so family history archives like our own, local history societies, um, local interest societies, they really might be off the beaten track of where you might look as a family historian. They might not have documents that directly relate to your ancestors, but instead they can offer an understanding of the lived experiences and explain decisions that your ancestors made. So they give insights into the common ways of living, for example, the rituals that govern daily life. They offer in-depth glimpses into how people thought or felt at a particular time. One of the other um, opportunities that I think smaller uh, archives like our own offer is a possible breakthrough of brick walls. So if you look outwards, if you consider sources um, that aren't necessarily directly about your ancestor, but are more broadly related to the time, the place, the circumstances they live in, you can reorient your knowledge on their lives based on more intimate details. For example, the accommodation they might've lived in, popular diets at the time, common migration patterns, uh, the one example that Gemma and I have both heard of is when you can't find a particular marriage certificate, for example, 
and you don't know why it's not registered at the nearest office, but then you consider the geographical landscape. There might be something to do with mountain regions during the winter that don't allow people to pass. There might be, uh, for example, uh, flooding during wet seasons. And so that changes where they might have registered their own marriage. That's the example we both heard from a number of our different uh, volunteers and members. But I think it does just show the importance of reaching outwards as you're trying to look inwards. So today we're just going to look at three different types of items in our collection. Again, we keep on emphasizing this. It is a very small amount of what we do have, but these are honestly, if I, if I am being honest, they're my favorites in the collection, the type of items that we're looking at. So I did kind of push it at Gemma uh, because I think these are really excellent collections. And they just show, I think, the importance of institutions um, and repositories like our own. So the first that I'm going to talk about is the different types of letters in the Society's collection. Uh, overwhelmingly, I think letters are my absolute favorite historical source, but again, more generally, they are just an incredible, incredible historical source. They offer glimpses into the personal and intimate lives of our ancestors, and they are one of the very few historical sources outside of this kind of legislative system that we usually find our documentation from. So rather than these kind of surveilling documents from governments like um, baptism, uh, you know, uh, marriage, death, all of those ones that are created officially as part of you existing in a society, letters are really on the margins of those documents. They really offer a very personal insight into the lives of our ancestors and into the feelings of individuals that aren't necessarily recorded from more official documentation. Letters can reveal how people resisted or embraced the time and place in which they lived. It really is, I think, a fascinating way to understand how people moved within the systems that they're brought up in. Um, and that's one of the, the reasons that I love them. I also love them because I think letters can give you a glimpse into people's personalities that I think it's very difficult to get at from traditional historical sources. One of Some of my favorite letters are the ones where people make jokes, you know, they're very humorous. I also think they offer a really tantalizing glimpse at the love that families and people can form. A lot of the time when we're looking at our ancestors, it's from these very stern Victorian portraits maybe. Um, and you, you don't necessarily get warmth from those types of images, but letters really do convey warmth, they convey love. Um, and I think they're an incredible resource. A caveat, of course, uh, for all, all documentations, uh, letters were only written by literate people. So obviously this excludes a large amount of people uh, in our societies. And the further back that your letter comes from, it also does carry very strong social class connotations. So the further back your letter's from, the more likely it is that the letter is written by someone who is from an educated and higher social class. Okay, so letters in our collection cover a large variety of themes. Uh, these are kind of the more common ones that I've pulled out. We have a number of war letters. So letters from World War I and World War II, from soldiers at the front writing back to family members. We have 19th, we have some 17th century, uh, but very, very few letters from England and Ireland to family members that immigrated to Australia. We have family history research correspondence from across the globe. And this is a very specific type of letter correspondence that I'm very interested in. It is a research methodology, I believe, that is unique to family historians, reaching outwards again in order to gather as much information about individuals and ancestral lines as possible. We have letters of sympathy following death and injury. We have letters regarding term um, employment, service and termination. And then we also have letters concerning payments and loans. So the letters that we have really can cover kind of from cradle to grave. It is a life experience of um, individuals that letters offer. So just a few that I'm going to talk to you about today. The first are the Beale letters. So the Beale letters come from one of our, I would say, um, most significant donations that we've received. Um, they were from and related to the family of Octavius Charles Beale, who was a famous piano manufacturer from Annandale, which is a suburb neighborhood of Sydney. Um, and he, he was very politically prominent. So uh, Octavius Charles Beale was born in 1850 in Ireland, and in 1854 he immigrated with his family to Van Diemen's Land, which is now known as Tasmania. Um, he then established Beale & Co., which is the piano manufacturing business, in 1884 in Annandale, 
It was incredibly successful. He was very well known for the beautiful craftsmanship. They were very well made pianos. They were also very beautiful pianos. Um, our CEO, Ruth Graham, actually owns a Veal piano, which is now uh, sitting in Richmond Villa, which is our offices and archives. Uh, so we're very lucky to have not only uh, the Octavius Veal collection, but now we have a Veal piano in our building as well. Um, so as part of the collection, we have a huge amount of correspondence from Beale family members, and it covers a large variety um, of, of the different family members who are both in Australia and back in Ireland. So I'm just going to use one letter as an example. I think it's a really interesting one. This is from Elizabeth Joseph Richardson to her mother, Elizabeth Beale, and it was written on uh, or dated January 1st, 1855. So it goes on to say, my beloved mother, I received your last letters, Julie, and Mary P sent me one she had from May, telling of your departure and the first symptoms of seasickness having set in. How we all long to know more of you the last few days, I cannot tell thee. We have watched each blast of wind ever since, night and day, and it kept beautifully calm until last evening. And I think that this is just a really beautiful opening that showcases how despite immigration was really seen as, as a fairly common way of life, I think particularly during this time, it really was difficult for family members. It really did create a lot of longing and missing, and it really did stretch, I think, the familiar bonds further than people would have liked. Um, it's also interesting that they were watching the, the skies and the seas to hope that the journey back to Ireland uh, was safe for their mother. And then this comes further down, this is about two or three pages in, and I think it's, it's just a fascinating glimpse into the social importance of gossip and how gossip really um, shapes the way we we know and feel about family members, about society and classes. And also, I think, the importance of marriage as a social institution. So, uh, Elizabeth writes, to turn to another new subject, that of our cousin Sarah James Pike intended marriage. Thou wilt regret to hear of it, I think. It has not yet taken place, but suppose it very soon will, as her mind seems quite made up. I have not seen her for some weeks. It will be a great change to her should she be amongst the husband's people but we hear that he lives far away from, he lives away from them. So there's a, so there's some trepidation. They're not really sure that this is the right step for Sarah. And then Elizabeth goes on to say, we heard, and I believe it is true that his father keeps a public house at Ruthry Land. I wonder if Sarah knows this. Several have been to see us to try and see, uh, to, to see, to try if there is any use in persuasion, but she appears to have decided on the steps. The young man is of prepossessing appearance and they say he's clever, but her two fine boys will be injured. One would fear much. So really going into, I think, the depths of, of what is considered a suitable match, uh, what is considered an unsuitable occupation for people at the time who are in the higher echelons of society. And I think also a really kind of sly and witty uh not necessarily a jab, but just kind of a little light play at why they think Sarah is interested in him, which is, of course, his prepossessing appearance. So I think this is just a really lovely letter. It showcases the close relationship between mother and daughter. It highlights some really important social values at the time. And it also um, demonstrates the length at which people and families would go to to keep in contact and um, keep these familiar bonds. So the second uh, letter that I would like to talk about are the Magna World War I letters. So this is part of a donation from a Merrick Sims. He was son of Veronica and Herbert Sims. The letters that I'm talking to you about are from Maxwell Magna, writing to his sister Veronica. Uh, so near Magna, who would go on to marry Herbert Sims. Um, he is writing to Veronica from the... Uh, training camps that he has joined uh, in England and then he goes on to write to her from the front and from the ships that he is traveling uh, on to reach the fighting. So he starts his first letter that is dated December 9th 1917. My dear sister Ron just a few lines to let you know I am okay and doing well at the time of writing and this is really how he starts all of his letters. He really just does want to reassure his sister that everything is going okay. Uh, he talks about his time in the training camp and meeting people that he already knows. So he went and saw George. He's on the staff of an Australian hospital in Southall. He has lost one eye, the left one, and he has three pieces of shell in his arm. His arm is as good as ever as they were only flesh wounds. He was hit in the eye with another piece. He had to have his eye taken out. But he has a glass eye 
now and to look at him one would think he was quite okay he looked remarkably well and says he's having a good time and I really believe him and I think this just shows kind of the banal mundanity of wartime and how these sort of injuries these life-changing traumatic events were seen as every day and the continual urge to see it as being okay and something that people could move on from and again I think he's really trying to reassure his sister that no matter what happens to him he will be okay that people are continuing their life through war. So this is the last letter um, there are four letters in our collection from Max to his sister Ronnie um, this is the last one he sends. It's dated February 16th, 1918. He says, I don't think there is any more news I can tell you, so I shall have to close with heaps of love and best wishes from your loving brother, Max. Um, so this letter was February 16th. Max died in action on March 10th, 1918. So this is, we think, the last correspondence that Max had to his family. And I think it's just a really beautiful and poignant collection that we have that showcases, I think, the very real traumatic events that people, your ancestors lived through and how we grapple with those. The final collection of letters that I want to talk about are the Von Plenty's research letters. So this is a very large collection of research papers from um, Franz Hartmann Macrossen Von Plenty's. He also donated his research papers to the State Library and also the National um, Archives. So it is a very large collection and as part of his donation, he has a number of different letters, research correspondence letters that he has sent across the globe pretty well, reaching out to people in hopes that they can tell him more about his own family history, but also he's sharing what he knows to try and connect others to their family history as well. These are quite early for research letters from family historians. So this is in 1937. Um, so this is one, it's written in German, but interestingly enough, Mr. Lenz, who is writing to Von Plenys, uh, is actually in Queensland at the time. So he's a fairly recent um, immigrant to uh, the area, and he is writing to Von Plenys in what we are assuming is his um, uh, native German. So this is uh, the, the direct transcription, and then this is my... Uh, I, I would not say official. It is a very loose uh, translation from my friends uh, who speak German and then also a lot of help from Google Translate as well. So I just want to preface this. I do not think it's um, entirely accurate, but basically it goes on to talk about how he's responding to, we think, a, um, a call for people to write to him about the family or the area that Von Plenty's put in the career mail. So Sealens is responding to that announcement and he's talking about um, his experiences in the area as one of the most honourable settlers. He is offering a description of his earlier events and his experiences. He thinks that they might be of interest. But he also says because he was at the in the wilderness at the time, he was unable to get a school education here, so there might be many writing errors. So just prefacing it that he's, he's a little bit uncomfortable with the literacy. Um, and I think that this is, again, just a really interesting way of showcasing the importance of research correspondence to family historians and what it offers um, as a research methodology. So this is another letter from Reverend O'Thiel to Mr. Von Plenys. And in this case, Von Plenys had previously offered Rev the Reverend a large variety of family history research materials. And so based on the information that Von Plenys had given O'Thiel, he looked for monuments in Cairns which is a city in northern Queensland, city, town, probably at the time, town in northern Queensland um, that had one of their shared common ancestors. So Reverend O'Thiel writes, when in Cairns, I looked at the very interesting, uh, into that very interesting piece of information I had from you, that in the time of Cairns had erected a monument in memory of the noted German bacteriologist, Professor Dr. Koch of Berlin. I did found a monument, a drinking fountain erected by the citizens of Cairns and districts in memory of Dr. Koch, the inscription showing the year of erection to be 1901. So again, just showcasing the global interchange of information and ideals, the networks that family historians have set up and been using for, as you can see, decades long. Um, I think the brilliance of the internet, the way that family historians are able to connect now. Hello, we're in Australia. We're, we're talking to you from Australia across the world. But these connections have been always important to family historians. And I think it's a really beautiful legacy that we are continuing on.
Okay, so the second collection that I am going to talk to you about is the Kwong Ta collection. And I think this is probably the collection of the most national and international significance that we have in our archive. So um, Mei Kwong Ta was an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, and a tea merchant. He was born in the Canton province in China in 1850, but at the age of nine, he came to Australia with an uncle to settle in the Braidwood district of New South Wales. So he was kind of adopted by the into the home of Scottish settlers, and he actually developed a Scottish brogue. When he talked in English, he had a very thick Scottish brogue. He was known for wearing kilts. He really was embraced by this Scottish family, and he saw that as kind of part of this twinned identity he had as Scottish, Australian, and then also Chinese. He went on to make his fortune on the gold fields, and using that fortune, he then invested in a series of tea shops and dining rooms, that were labelled Kwong Tart and Company around Sydney. So the most well-known buildings, are, sorry, the most well-known tea rooms were situated in the Queen Victoria Market, which is now the QVB. It is literally just across the way. We could see it if, the, if um, some of the taller buildings were, were cut down. Um, and it is a gorgeous building and it has retained, I would say, social and political prominence in Sydney until this time. Um, it was during this time that Kwong Tart built his home Gallup House in Ashfield, and he really was, I cannot under uh, overemphasize, I think, how influential he was in society at the time. He utilized his wealth and influence to assist others within the community. He was an incredible socialite. He donated his time and wealth to many organizations and individuals. He also was a political campaigner um, against certain causes that he felt very strongly about at the time, including racism at the turn of the century. Kwong Tart is this incredible figure because he existed in Australia at a time as a Chinese man when there was a very strong anti-Chinese sentiment. This was during the development of the White Australia policy, which would last for decades, that really restricted the movement and existence of non-white people in Australia. Um, and he really was apart from this. He was seen as overcoming, I, I would say, the racial barriers at the time to really be an incredibly popular and well-known and successful businessman. Um, so we were incredibly lucky to be given the material. So in 1964, Lewis McAvoy, who was a um, descendant of Kwong Tart, donated to the Society of Australian Genealogists the papers and photographic collection of Kwong Tart. So this collection documents Kwong Tart's life from the 1880s onwards and features in particular his philanthropic activities in the late 19th century Sydney. So his collection documents the life of a successful businessman. He's positioned between the colonial elite, the colonial working class. He's positioned between white social society and the Chinese society at the time, who were very far apart. The collection includes a number of photographs as well as four scrapbooks filled with press clippings, menus, programs and invitations, assortment of letters and telegrams. It is a very vast collection. Um, so I'm going to go into uh, one or two details because um, I think... I just want to be mindful of the time. So the Kwong Tart collection is really important because it covers life as an immigrant in Australia at the turn of the 20th century. It demonstrates the kind of pervasive nature of race and racism against Chinese immigrants during the drafting and implementation of the white Australia policy. It showcases uh, the difficulty of having interracial relationships and their generational legacies uh, and how, how things can blossom from from uh, socially maligned places at the time. The social activities and cultural norms of higher society in Sydney goes into detail. It also shows business practices and ethics for entrepreneurs during the time. And it also showcases social and political networks of the time. It really is an incredible collection of material. So this is one of the items. I think I have four items that I'm just gonna really quickly uh, show you. Uh, I think it covers a breadth of what we have. If you have any questions about any of what we've been talking about, I think it will um, go well. Oh, I've misspelled room. <laughs> the office. So this is a uh, tea room menu from Kwong Tart's Tea Room. It is, we think, a really great showcasing of what was on offer at the time and this really beautiful blend of, again, the different cultures that he was immersed in. We have um, rhubarb with rice or custard. He has his famous teas across the side. It really is just this wonderful collection of the time. And just it's important to note that Kwong Tart actually pushed forward the idea of 
kind of low cost but very high quality uh, food accessibility at the time, there was this kind of gap in the market. There was either like quite quite cheap food that you could become available and then there was quite expensive food that you would have to go and dine for. But he saw this kind of very casual eatery, a middle level, and he really pushed forward the idea, I'm going to use the term that is very popular now in Australia, but the idea of cafe culture, which I think is fairly integral to Australian culture now. And Quang Tart really saw the possibilities of the cafe to be this kind of middle area between the home and the workplace. Um, and he really pushed forward this, this understanding. We also have the Kwong Tart um, marriage congratulations. So Kwong Tart married Margaret Scarlett, who was from a very well-to-do family. The families were friends. Margaret was quite a, a, a decent amount younger than Kwong Tart, um, but the families had known each other for quite a long time. They moved in the same social circles, but upon their engagement and then eventual marriage, um, Margaret's father refused to attend the wedding because of its interracial nature. So even knowing Kwong Tart, being, being friends with him, didn't overcome the stigma of marrying into a race other than your own at the time. Um, but despite this kind of family drama that's happening at the time, we have um, a huge amount of telegrams from people wishing the Tarts success and love in their marriage. So I think, again, showcasing how he was seen to be separate for a lot of other people from this, this racist attitude about interracial marriages. So there's just two up here that I have. Uh, one is written from a Mr. Gallagher. It says, well done, old man, thumping luck and fat barns, uh, which is obviously for the word for children. Um, and then we also have um, a, a telegram from a mayor um, of, I think it is um, Wollongong. The mayor of Wollongong sends his congratulations, uh, wishing Mr. Tart, Mrs. Tart um, happiness and uh good spirits i think that's what it says so uh just really showing the the breadth of people that are congratulating quang tart on his marriage and also again the society that he's moving with we also have and this was collected by uh, margaret during her marriage to quang tart these are incredible scrapbooks they are pages and pages and pages of the invites the tarts received to various events uh if, events and social occasions so this is just one page and on the one page you have three very different events you have the ashfield music society you have intercolonial lacrosse and then you also have the agricultural society of new south wales so he was quang tart involved in a large variety of different social causes of different social activities he really was an incredibly popular man that worked in in society across a number of different levels and then finally, we have a large collection of letters um, from concerned public members following a brutal attack on Quang Tart. So in 1902, Quang Tart was closing up his tea room in the QVB and he was attacked by a man, uh, brutally attacked, I think with a machete, and he um, he fell, he, uh, he survived for another 11 months, but he wasn't well, and then eventually he would go on to die in 1903 after an 11 month period of, of kind of very poor health. And so what we have in our collection is a large amount of letters from letters and telegrams from very concerned um, people in society, reaching out, offering their sympathies to Quang Tart and his family, wishing him well, hoping that he recovers, and then upon his death, expressing sincere condolences to his wife and family. Um, this is from the um uh union i think of um uh train uh, train union in ashfield um so showcasing again kind of who he is involving himself with the people that really cared about him and what i got from these letters is really just the the sincere way that people were reaching out the kind of grief that they felt over his attack um and and emphasizing how popular how well liked he was in society um, and again, the Quang Tart collection showcases a very interesting man at a very interesting time in our society and how he he was he was really accepted and beloved despite all of these other social uh, emphasis upon a racist um, white Australia policy, moving towards kind of limiting the the 
the businesses that Chinese um, immigrants could have. And so how Kong Tart managed to move in societies despite all of these barriers. Um, so those are the two that I'm going to talk about. I'm now going to hand over to Gemma, who will talk about um, another type of collection we have in our archive. So I think we're up to the third the third type uh, in our archives, which are travel diaries, as you can see on the slide here. So uh, the Society has numerous travel diaries in its collection, uh, and these have been donated to us from all different sorts of people, uh, all different sorts of families, and they really cover a wide variety of, of people, but of uh, places and periods throughout our history, um, and also the, the histories that they detail, the times that they talk about. Uh, so you might think that travel diaries are a somewhat unconventional resource, uh, particularly if they're not related directly to your family. But we think, uh, Alex and I have certainly been talking, we think that they can be very, very useful, particularly if we're thinking more broadly about the lives of our ancestors. So uh, travel diaries might detail, for example, um, a place in the world where your ancestor lived or where they travelled to. Uh, they might also tell you about the particular ship they were travelling on or more generally just about travelling at that particular period of time. So what what um, what it might have been like to travel in a, on a ship in the 1880s, for example. Uh, it might also tell help you understand and tell about the migrant experience in a different country or going from one country to another. Uh, and lastly, but not by no means least, um, they might also provide a historical perspective on a certain historical event or even the aftermath of, a, of an event as well. So diaries in our collection cover things such as, and not limited to, uh, travels in Europe in the 1970s, uh, personal perspectives of countries and cultures. Uh, we have some diaries particularly that look at this type of thing for uh, England, Scotland and France in the 1880s. Uh, perspectives on travel as more recently in the 1960s, travels to particular places in New South Wales, so that's the state of Australia where Alex and I are in, and uh, this, the diary that I'm thinking of particularly relates to country towns in New South Wales. Um, so, you know, small places very far from the, very far from the cities that may not have been so well documented. Uh, they cover also travel to popular tourist destinations, so a lot of things and places that people would really know, so things like the Great Barrier Reef or Darwin at the north, in the north of Australia. Uh, international travel between uh, England and Australia as far back as the 1880s as well. Uh, this particular diary that I, for this point has significant information about the weather at the time, so that, that can be sort of information that is hard to, uh, hard to obtain sometimes. And we also have another diary in the collection that is of an actor or performer and has lots of information about London in the 1950s as well. So the first one uh, that we're going to look at is this diary here, which is the travel diary of Maria Apsi Brunskill. So Maria was traveling around the UK in about 1879 to 1880. And this is an image of what we have in the collection. So this is not the original of Maria's diary. It is a handwritten, as you can see here, a handwritten transcript uh, of the original. So um, what I've done is just pulled out a few quotes, as Alex did as well uh, earlier, about uh, some, some quotes that Maria has from the diary. So this one, she says, uh, we took a walk around the, to the convent and had a look in the church, which is the prettiest I've ever been in. So I think this is providing commentary on a few different uh, different things. So it might be uh, about the specific place where Maria was and specific time uh, that she was traveling. So this is in 1879, this particular portion of the diary. Uh, so if you had ancestors from that particular place, or maybe who got married uh, in that church, that would provide you with uh, some information about that about that particular place. But it also gives us an idea about the ideals and the beauty that uh, Maria saw in the architecture as well of this uh, of this particular church. We've got another quote from Maria's diary where she's talking about traveling um, in this instance from London to Edinburgh uh, via the Flying Scotsman, and she's traveling in the most distinguished company of Hugh Campbell, uh, who was MP for Berwick at the time. So this again, uh, you might be uh, researching an ancestor who did a similar route in their travel. They were traveling from London to Edinburgh and it was in the same time frame as Maria. It's gonna give you uh, some ideas about that. Um, it's also going to help you if you're lucky enough to be related to uh, Sir Hugh Campbell, 
uh, about his movements. So th sort of, I guess, maybe some incidental trips that you might not otherwise know about um, and may not be documented elsewhere other than uh, in a diary, for example, of someone who was obviously uh, sharing a transport and trip with him. So then we're going to move on to uh, the second travel diary. So this is one of John Henry Wardle or Wardell. And you can see from this one, again, this is an image of what we have in the collection. So this is a typed transcript. So not the original, uh, but a typed one of um, John, if I can call him that. And he was traveling in 1883. So quite some time ago uh, from now. So we've got, we've got some quotes again from John's diary, and he's travelling from Plymouth in England to Sydney. And he says that we started out from Plymouth on January the 13th, 1883. We were tugged out to the Allen Shore by a small steamer and went on board the Allen Shore about 11 o'clock in the forenoon. Weighed anchor about one o'clock, was tugged out two miles. It was a very fine afternoon with fair wind and a lot of people sick towards the night. So this, we think, is really providing commentary on, on travel indeed on the Allen Shore and what it was like, but also just in general in that period of time. So the process that would have happened for people who were travelling, um, you know, travelling that route or into just ship travel uh, during that time as well. This is the diary from the point where he mentions lots of weather information and you'll see that reoccurring in the next couple of slides. So this is another quote from uh, John, and on January the 20th, he's saying here that the seas are running mountains high, so very high the ship rolled some something fearful all day and night. You could not see it sometimes for the waves. So I just think in that first part, you can really imagine um, what it was like. Uh, it's sort of a thing of movies, um, what it must have been like on that ship for John and his fellow passengers. He then goes on to say that they passed a wrecked ship about half past seven in the evening. She had all her masts blown away and we could not see any sailors on her. So he, he uh, assumes that they were either all drowned or killed or they'd gone to the boats and maybe, uh, maybe sought help. He goes on to say as well that the captain would have liked to have sent a boat to her, but the seas were too rough to do that. So... It also, uh, you know, is providing more information about what it was like travelling at that time, but also uh, or about the ship's captain. And you can see that he had good intentions. He did want to go and check on this boat. Um, it does also provide another avenue for re research if you really wanted to know uh, what ship that was. So what had sunk, um, and perhaps you were looking at it from a, the other perspective. So you might have had ancestors or people that you're researching who were on a ship that sunk, um, this might be providing a perspective from some from another ship that was going past. Uh, just as an example, uh, my favourite line, and I think Alex is too, when we were talking about this. So he goes on to say that the ship did roll something fearful that night. Water cans, tins, teapots, and barrels were rolling about all night, and the women and children were screaming. You could not stand without you had to hold of something. And I think that is so uh, so evocative and paints such a picture. And I could hear uh, the water cans and the tins just rattling and the children screaming. And you can just imagine how awful um, <laughs> it probably was. And uh, from his earlier comment on that same day, you know, the seas are mountains high. That it's, you, you can really imagine it. Um, so, yeah, a great depiction, I think, from our friend John. Again, this is his diary, uh, another quote from his diary. It's a few different days uh, put together here. So um, you can see on the January the 31st, John is saying it's he's doing his weather report. So we've got very fine light breeze and that a child was born uh, um, on board the ship. You can see uh, not two days, two days later, it was a fine morning. The sea was calm. There was a light breeze and there was the death of the child born on January the 31st. He goes on to say, I'm just, yeah, I'm just mindful of the time, but he does go on to say that, um, for example, he comments on how beautiful the moon is, which is really lovely, uh, it, you know, bigger and brighter than it is in England. Uh, but he says again that another child died. So you can see in this very short amount of time, um, it's about six weeks, I think. And there's many more entries in the actual diary than these ones here, that there's uh, many births of children and many deaths of children as well. And I think that's, uh, you know, an interesting 
perspective and commentary on the fragility of life at the time and on the ship, what that would have been like. Um, but then also, if you did have ancestors traveling on this particular ship, uh, John, as well as the weather, he does love giving coordinates. Um, there's none included here. But if you were trying to research an ancestor, perhaps who was who born was born or died on that ship, you might have a better idea of dates and um, and things like that. So the last diary um, we're going to look at is that of Charles I Iono. Um, this is a thermal photocopy that we have in the collection. Uh, and Charles was writing in 1817. He was travelling to Italy from England. Um, he was in, in association, I guess, with an inheritance. So we have we have this. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we have the original. <laughs> this is a thermal photocopy. This image is of the thermal photocopy. You can see on here that the writing is quite uh, quite easy to read, actually. So given its age, so 1817, it is quite uh, quite easy to read. So these are some quotes from Charles. Um, he, you know, he talks about in the first one there that they were busy seeking an interpreter, uh, couldn't find one that they were that they were, you know, happy with. Um, he talks about uh, some things that they've seen and, you know, the steps that they've climbed and how beautiful places are. Um, he also does talk in his diary a lot about what they ate. <laughs> so he's very, uh, likes to report on the food, um, the food really and, and the places that they saw. So um, you can see also in the very last point on this slide, he comments, oh, sorry, last line, he comments that the fever rages very bad in Milan as it's so very warm. And that uh, we we discussed is another avenue for research because was it was the fever raging because it was so warm or was the fever raging because there was some sort of a virus? Um, you know, what is he trying to tell us in that instance? So um, lots to kind of look at um, for further research in that, uh, that particular part of the diary. So then um, you can see Saturday the 28th, he says that Charles says we made five hours to a lone house where we had a very good dinner. Uh, so again, he's uh, providing commentary on the food uh, and that all the towns in France and Italy have beautiful walks around them. And then he says uh, this comment, which is, we saw this two days past, a woman at a plough with two horses. Everything has far backwater here, about here, than when we left Italy, but everything looks promising. So he's really chosen to mention this particular instance that there was a woman at a plough. So mo as I said, most of the commentary in the diary is about food uh, and about the beautiful things they saw, but he's obviously picked this particular instance out to comment on, probably because it was very different to maybe where he was from. So maybe not a woman's uh, role. And so he's, um yeah, that's why he's commenting about a woman at a plough here. Okay, so they're all the diaries. So just, uh, I know we are almost up to question time, but if you wanted to explore our collection, how might you be able to do that from wherever you are? So first up, uh, you can visit our website, um, which is www.sag.org.au. This is what it will look like. This screenshot was only taken a couple of days ago. And you can see in the top left-hand corner there, there is a button that I have highlighted uh, with, with purple that says search out collections. So if you click on that one, the next screen that you'll see will look like this. This is the top of the screen and you'll be presented with two catalogs. To search for any of the things uh, that Alex and I have spoken about today, you would select search our archive catalog, which is the blue button. Then you're going to have a screen that looks something similar to this. And this is where, again, I've outlined in purple this box here where you can put in your search terms. So I would really emphasize when you're searching the archives catalog to search by name uh, of a person, an individual, a family, or a place. They're probably going to be the best ways for you um, to search. So I have used an example here that doesn't do that, <laughs> but um, please, please just keep that in mind if you are searching for the catalog. So if I was searching for travel diary, which is indeed what I did, um, to prepare for today, this is where uh, this is where you put your search term in, do a basic search, and this is the screen that you would be presented with. So what we've got here, you can see, um, we'll just go to the next slide. So in the purple, um, you can see that any any of these numbers that appear underneath item, title, and description, that's where your search term appears in the title of the item. And all the numbers below are hyperlinked. So the eight, for example, where we've got the circle here is uh, is hyperlinked. 
Then we've got the next one over as well, and that's where the search term appears in the references for the item. And again, they're all hyperlinked. So uh, make sure that you check both of those uh, when you're looking for when you're looking at things. So if you were to click, um, oh, and I might have missed something, but if you were to click on that, uh, you, you would be presented with uh, a summary of the item. So this is the summary for the last diary we looked at uh, of Charles. And you can see it gives you a bit of a description about what it is um, and uh, just a bit of a preview, really. And then you have a couple of options from here as well. So in the top right-hand side of the screen where we've got the yellow box, that's where you can email yourself a citation of the item. So if you want to come back to it later, uh, that's where you can remind yourself of what the item was that you were looking at. And if you decide it's really something you'd like to know more about, so you maybe like a copy um, or to see if a copy is possible, you can click on the request view or copy tab, which is outlined in the bluey green uh, color, more towards the left of the slide. Okay, so I think we're done. Um, I'm looking at the time, and perfect. so we we have perfect time. Uh, so we've got ten minutes for questions. But I will just emphasise that uh, we we have asked if you can provide feedback on our session. We would be more than happy to receive it. Uh, the way to do that, um, like I, I guess for many other Roots Tech sessions, uh, on the Roots Tech mobile app, you go to our session. Um, you scroll down to fill out the survey and you'll be presented with a screen similar to the one that you see on the slide where you can um, rate uh, the, the session and the presenters. Um, so we'd really like to know what you thought of the session. As Alex mentioned, it is our first time. So be really happy um, to hear from you. On the next slide, we might just quickly go to it, but then we're going to do questions as well. This is all of our contact information. So the thing probably firstly to remember is just the website. Mm. So uh, as I've said, www.sag.org.au. Um, you can find links on there to email us, but the email address is above as well. So info at sag.org.au. And then come and find us on social media. So we've listed, I think they're all of them are there. Um, so we're on Facebook, we're on uh, Twitter or X. Uh, we're on LinkedIn and we are also on Instagram. So the handle to remember or across most of those is uh, at uh, SOC, so SOC Ost Gen. Um, come find us um, or send us an email. We would be more than happy to hear from you. And now I think we're more than happy to take questions yeah. if there are any. Awesome. I will stop sharing. Right? Yeah, I think so. There we go. And yeah, thank you so much for everyone for being here. And are there any questions about anything we've covered or maybe not covered um, that you want to know about the society? No questions. <laughs> if you don't want to, you can always put them in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's looking like right now I'm not seeing any questions, but um, they're more than welcome to add them to the chat as the presentation goes on. So right. thank you so much, uh, Alexandra and Gemma, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. So we'll just sit here for seven. I've got one question from the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, Amazing. The live stream. I'll post it for you guys to see. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So the question in the chat is, are most of these resources digitized with the images available through the SAG website with an overseas subscription? What types of documents are available in person only versus digitized? Great question. Um, so I would say approximately last count we did 15% of our archive is digitized. Um, so it's not a huge amount, obviously, but we are running a digitization program, as I believe most archives are, to increase that number. We also do digitize on uh, demand. So that is basically where if you find something and you request it, the vast majority of what we have is digitizable. So we, um, we digitize it and then we send a link. Uh, it's a Dropbox links at the moment, and then you receive the, um, 
item that way. So pretty well anything you request, we can make available through digitization. Um, and it is really easy for us to do. It's a great service. I think that we offer both members and non-members. Uh, so I really encourage you, if there is anything that you would like to see a copy of, please uh, send us an email, request it through Midas, and we will have a chat with you about making sure that that's possible. Anything else to add to I that? I don't think so. I don't think so. There's another question in the chat, which is, uh, do you have any other letters? I'm going to hand that over to Alex because she will know for sure because she loves them as we I found do. out. I do love them. We have a lot of letters. Um, we have a huge amount. So that really was just three samples that I thought uh, went over uh, a pretty good variety of the types of letters we have. We have a large variety. Um, we really, really do. There's there's a lot that we're continuing to process as we get more and more donations. Um, but yeah, we, we have a large amount. We have a lot from Australia. We have a large amount from people outside of Australia writing to people in Australia. Um, it's really, it is, it is, I would say, one of the largest types of items that we have. Um, and also, again, my favourite. Um, Next question we've got is how much is membership? Thank you for asking. Uh, membership uh, is for one year is 90 Australian dollars. Uh, for two years, it's 160 Australian dollars. And there are some other um, subscriptions beyond beyond two years. Um, so you can join online. Uh, no matter where you are in the world. Uh, and we do have a members area on our website mm -hmm. where you can access some things remotely, um, but where you can, and certainly, sorry, I should have said also, certainly as a member, you do have free access to some uh, events and webinars that we do, and then subsidised access to uh, to the others, so subsidised fee for the others. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the great things that we do at the Society, and, you know, thank big thank you to our volunteers again, uh, on a Friday afternoon, Australian Eastern Daylight Time, uh, we do have hangout sessions where it's an opportunity for, you know, our community of family historians to get together and to talk about uh, specific um, themes or topics. So every week is a different theme. Uh, and so for those of you who maybe can't make it at that particular time, they are recorded and you do have access to a very large back catalogue of those. So you can watch them and get hints and tips for your uh, for your research as well. But to answer the question, ninety dollars, ninety Australian dollars for one year uh, membership. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question in the chat. Do you have to be a member to search your archives? No, you do not. So you can log on to our catalog uh, the way that Gemma showed you. It's called Midas. Um, and then you just search there. You do have to be a member to see the references. So remember when Gemma showed you the two different types, there are the... Um, the names and description, that comes up if you're a member or a non-member. But to get the individual references, you do have to be a member and logged in. But you can search the catalogue regardless. Um, so we then have two questions about kind of specific research problems that people are having with Australian ancestors. Yeah, so there's a question there about uh, I've been searching for my grandmother's brother and we know he went to Australia, but after that I'm lost. Um, I would really encourage whoever that is in the crowd, please get in touch with us. Um, we're more than happy to to give you some hints and tips um, about some sort of general resources where you might be able to find it. And if it's beyond that, so if it does become a little bit of a tricky, a tricky question, um, we do have research volunteers who love nothing more than a challenge. So so uh, we would be more than happy to pass that on. And members get that research service mm -hmm. for free. Um, and non-members, there is a research fee for that. But I would really encourage you just to get in touch because I know that being on the ground in the country where that person might have gone, where that person went to, um, we might be able to offer you some tips in terms of online searching and, and free resources and things that, you know, might, might help you um, that you may not be aware of. Mm. Yeah, and just to emphasise that... Um... Although we, we were specifically talking about our own archival collections here today, we are an excellent resource if you're looking for any sort of genealogical research in Australia. And that if you have any questions about your ancestors and where they might have gone in Australia, we would be more than happy to help out with any sort of research that we can do. Yeah. Um, and, and like Gemma said, point you towards other um, institutions and repositories as well. And I know we've got one minute left, so very quickly to answer the other question about uh, corresponding with a third cousin, um, granddaughter about common ancestors in Australia uh, via New Zealand, I think it is. Um, 
again, I would say please get in touch with us, but also please search our archives catalogue. Mm. So the one we showed you, please put those surnames, uh, last names, family names into the catalogue to see what there might be. But by all means, get in touch with us uh, via email and we can probably give you some hints and tips. We do also have a New Zealand research group. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> which is very strong. It's a robust one. So yeah. please get in touch with us and we can ho hopefully help you out with that. Yeah. I think we we might get cut off any minute now, any second now. Yeah. So. I think it might cut out, but thank you so yeah. much to everyone. We've really enjoyed having you and answering your questions. You. I think we might be done. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Yay. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Excellent. Oh, thank, thank you. you.